why don't you stand with me? Let's just turn our hearts toward the Lord. Ooh. Do this for me. We don't ever do this. Just humor me. Put your hand on the person next to you, and let's just let's just pray for each other this morning. Holy Spirit, I just pray for the people next to me, and I just pray that you would touch them, you would minister to them. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would show up and you would just take, overwhelm them with your love, overwhelm them with your presence. Hmm. The deepest longings in their heart today, God, I pray that you would come and meet them there. Hmm. Take them deeper today with you than they've ever been before. Completely, completely overwhelm them. God, that today they would walk out of here with such an assurance of your love, with such an, so hope filled. <clears throat> that they would just be so in love with you. They would just be an unquenchable fire as they leave this place today. And Lord, we come right now as a family. We come as your bride. We come as your bride to be with our groom. We come to tell you how much we adore you. We come to tell you how in love we are with you. We come right now to tell you that you mean everything to us. You're worthy of our praise. You're worthy of our adoration. And we just pour that out on you today, God. We pour that out on you today. Holy Spirit, come and just wash everything else away. We, we want our worship to be pure. We want it to be a pure gift that we bring to you. Right now, we just, we align ourselves with you. We've, we ask forgiveness for things that we, maybe we haven't asked forgiveness for, things that, that happened this week or even this morning. We just want to be washed completely clean right now. And we want to offer you a gift with clean hands and a pure heart. Yeah. Who can see the Lord? Those with clean hands and a pure heart. We long to see you today, God. We long to know you. We long to be with you.
courage of the blood. Crying and holy is the Lord. Crying and holy is the Lord. Holy, I will say, as if I could look away. Crying and holy, crying and holy, crying and holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord.
there's nothing worth more
you guys could just stand up for a minute, that would be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Lord. Here's, here's what I know about the, the presence of God when it comes into a room is that God will visit a house or visit a place and he will begin to transform the whole place with his presence. But I want us to internalize this for a moment because um, the way that it really begins is by individual hearts being set on fire. And I know that the line says that you'll come and you'll change the entire atmosphere. And the truth is, is that when we start walking through all the stuff and everything that we're going through in the world, we pick up a lot of atmosphere. <laughs> and so many times when we come to a church set houses like this, it's hard to move into the presence of God because we're carrying the atmosphere of the world into the house. And so when we sing this song again, would you put your hand over your heart and say, Holy Spirit, you are welcome, not here, which is, he's everywhere, but you're welcome here. You're welcome to touch and transform and change my heart. You see, a lot of us will go into a place like this and we'll carry so much of the stuff with us, we can't get into the place of sweet worship because we're so bogged down by the cares and the things and all of the junk that we've been going through through the week. And it's why when we begin to turn our hearts toward Jesus, the old line in the song says, the things of earth grow strangely dim. And sometimes it happens very quickly because we jump on to the breakthrough that a neighbor right next to us in the house is having. Hunger and thirst is contagious. You can see hunger and thirst on someone and say, well, I'm not going to miss out on that. And you begin to posture your heart, and next thing you know, the whole house begins to experience together what God intended in terms of the glory realm. But I, I feel like we've brought in a lot of our own stuff to the house today. And it would just be good to lay it aside so that Jesus can just love on us and that we can give him the honor and the glory due him. There's plenty of stuff out there that, that'll touch us next week or whatever else. But if we find ourselves in this place where our atmosphere has changed internally, I promise you that when you go into the world and when you step out of the doors of this church, Whatever you're facing will seem completely different than when it did when it was affecting you this last week. Because the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and the light of his grace. So Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. Could you sing it with me again? Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Come on, welcome him in. This place. Come on, let's just sing it until we mean it. So you're welcome. You're welcome to move, Holy Spirit. You're welcome.
welcome be released in this house. Move in every heart and every life in Jesus' name. Yes, Lord, we worship you. Yes, Lord, we honor your presence. We honor your King of glory. Come into this place, Jesus. Oh, you are welcome here. You are welcome here. You are welcome here. You are welcome here. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come fly. You're welcome in this place. This place. Change the atmosphere. Your glory, God. Your glory is what we've longed for. Guy, they come up here and pray over our house. room, God, and your presence in Ogden, God, your glory, God. Jesus, Lord Jesus, so let us, our hearts, align with your heart, God. Let our actions align with your actions, God, and let our thoughts align with your thoughts, God. Jesus, I pray for this day that our hearts leave change are guided, God, in these next days by your presence. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Your presence is what we long for. Because in your presence, everything, everything changes. In your presence, everything comes to alignment in our hearts. Oh, Jesus. Today, do what you want to do in our hearts and lives. Yeah. Just, just pray with me. Just say this. Jesus, today I'm listening to your voice. Huh. This is a good prayer. Today, I renounce every voice except yours. Yeah. Anything demonic, we break it off in Jesus' name. Only the voice of the Spirit. Yeah. you guys love on some people we're going to come right back so uh, we'll take a minute and transition into the message but bless you guys
All right. So good to be with you guys. Whoo. Yeah. It's good to love on each other. Yeah. Let me just, we just have just a couple of announcements. Very short today. But um, April 23rd and 24th, that's a Saturday and a Sunday. We have Tim and Cindy McGill with us again. How many of you were here last time we had Tim and Cindy with us? They are so fun, so fun, and will just rock your world. And um, so Cindy will be doing a school on Saturday, and then um, they're, they're both going to be with us Sunday morning at our normal time. So are we signing up for the school on her site? I think so, yeah. She's, yeah. She hasn't given me the address yet. But let me, let me talk this. I just got a text message from Cindy about what the school is going to be about because a lot of people have been wondering, well, what's the school? Cindy is like one of the most incredible people at bringing Jesus into environments where people um, um, wouldn't expect him to be. Uh, one of the things that she's been doing for years is up at the Sundance Film Festival. They have a, a team that's been going up there for years doing dream interpretation. And, and guess who shows up? All of the Hollywood elite. And they get her cornered and they don't want to let her go because they have so much fun you know, discovering that the heart of God is for them and toward them. She's also been doing things down at the porn convention in, in Las Vegas, which seems like a terrible place to be. Um, but that's where Jesus wants to show up to love on these girls. And it's just amazing. But here's what she wrote to me. She says, in, in regarding the school, consider your field. Redefining who Jesus is to a world who don't know who he is. God hardened, godless, and God confused. Giving language to avoid... Um, language landmines and religious arguments, dreams and interpretation of dreams, Identi identity recovery, helping people discover themselves and their purpose, using a menu board to create an effective outreach. Like, and that's what they do at the Burning Man. They'll create a menu, menu board of things that you can come into their tent and receive. Like, I can't remember, like spiritual readings, spiritual readings soul cleansing, you know, kind of stuff in language that, that seems... Um, totally accepting to even like the, all the new age people, and then they come in and they encounter Jesus. It's not deceptive, it's wisdom. So there you go. Word art or true reflections using a mirror to create God-given images to people, overcoming brokenness and self-hate. God's heart for those who are away from him and how to communicate with the LGBTQ communities and gender-confused counter-woke cultures. How to create outreach teams in a new age pagan arenas, healing and miracles. The Holy Spirit created atmosphere or portal. God given authority and how he wants to use it and to be aware of intercessors and prayer coverings. Um, deliverance and transformation, activation, impartation classes. All of it. It's going to be absolutely wonderful. Just your run of the mill conference. Yeah. You know, just normal, should be normal things. Yeah. Uh, we just, we adore Tim and Cindy. They're, they're just super good friends of ours. They pastored here in Utah for years. And um, come on, just come and get some skills. You know, we, we all want to reach people. And sometimes we think like, well, I don't know how to do that. And the Holy Spirit can tell you. But honestly, sometimes it's great just to have your, your ideas and the education you have so far taken out of the box. Because you're not going to run into everybody that's the same. You're going to run into people who have, they have no grid for who Jesus is at all. I, I know we think that's hard to believe in America, but it's far more common than you think it is. You know, and they, or they have all these ideas of, of new age ideas. They don't even know it's new age. They've just gathered stuff. But I'm going to tell you that everybody's a seeker. Everyone is a seeker. They just don't always know what they're seeking. But they're seeking him. He is the desire of the nations. So come, I promise you, it'll challenge you. You'll have a blast. Make sure you're here. Set that weekend aside. It's going to be so amazing. So it's going to be really good. Um, one other thing. Um, this Tuesday night, the 22nd, uh, Monica is hosting a meeting for our preschool and nursery workers. 
If you are interested in volunteering in those areas, you are so encouraged and welcome to come to that meeting. It's at 6.30. Are you doing it in the Connor room? Probably, okay, so downstairs, down these stairs just to the left in the Connor room, um, 6.30 this Tuesday. It's gonna be great. We, we actually do not have um, preschool and nursery this morning because we didn't have enough um, kids ministers to do it. So um, it's just vital all the way around. It's, it's vital for, for the kids, they need it. It's vital for the moms, it's vital you know, for the church. It just benefits everyone. And so I always, I always say, you know, our kids are our treasures. If, if, we, if I trust you with my kids, I am trusting you with the most valuable thing God's given me. So it's really, it's such a vital ministry. So if you'd like to be part of that, come Tuesday night, 6.30, you can kind of meet the team. It, they have a lot of fun together, too. So come and meet the team, hang out, get an idea of, of what we do down there. We are very purposeful with what we do. It's not babysitting. We're not here to babysit your kids. We're here to teach. We're here to impart. We're here to train. We have a friend that, that um, it was a girl, actually, that was here with us um, years and years ago when we first took this church, and she headed the nursery ministry at Bethel in Reading, and she used to call it training for raining. You know, you train them up when they're young. When you're when you're a king or or when you're in line for a throne, you learn very young. They don't wait till you're 18 and go. Oh, by the way, let me teach you how to be royalty. No, 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 no. You learn from the time you're born. You learn what it's like to be royalty, and that's what we teach our kids. You are supernatural royalty. This is what that looks like. So it's just an amazing ministry. Please come and be part of that. Um, it, it, you'll, I promise you, you'll get as much out of it as the kids do. Because it's just, it's really a blessing. So that's going to be great. If you want to give today, most of you are familiar with how you can give with multiple ways. You can text to give, 84321. You can do an, is it called an ACH? I never do this right. ACH, you can do, get on the website and give. Um, we kind of are, we never do this before. I don't know why. I know it. And then I just, I just never tell anybody. But if you give through our website rather than texting, it actually, more of, you, what, of your donation goes to the church or the bank draft. So more of that, more of that goes to the church because it costs us, you guys know this, when you use credit cards or things at stores, they charge you a higher fee. And so they charge us a higher fee as well. So you don't have to. We're thankful for whatever. But if you just if you want more of it to go toward the church, then um, you can do a bank draft online, and that just doesn't cost us that high of a fee. So we're trying to remember to tell people that <laughs> this year because we've never really told people that before. So um, outreach yesterday was amazing from what I heard. Yes, yes. Sorry we couldn't be there. We were doing a little, um, a little emergency plumbing fixing. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Um, but, but we had fun, great fun. I could show you videos of, of Shannon and Anna. You don't want to, you didn't have fun, honey? He had fun with his daughter. You didn't have fun with the PVC and the sawzalling, the old metal plumbing. And yeah, it's a tearing out ceilings. We had two kind of little mini disasters yesterday, but we got through both of them. We did great. So. Anyway, ta-da! So, um, so we, we hate that we missed it, but we heard it was amazing, and we, we ask around. So we just appreciate everyone that came and everyone that ministered. And Oh, oh, there's, there's. Oh, good job. Woo, woo, good job. I love that. I mean, I love it when we have it for you guys, but I love it when we can just bless people and give it all out. It's great fun. Um, so. And I would say this, maybe you do this anyway, but our, our outreaches are almost always the third Saturday. Pretty well always, right, Misty and Reggie? So if you talk to people, please tell them to come. Tell, tell them, like, come, even if you don't need it, if you need to pick up for somebody else, come. That's what it's for. So, you know, it's not just to, like, there's no little circle here. This is, if you need it, come and get it. If you have a friend that needs it, and they can't come, come for them. We don't put people through a third degree. We're just like, how many families are you picking up for? Okay, awesome. 
and we just load them down. So please, that's the whole point. We're, we're just a conduit. So we just want it to come in and go out. That's it. And it's just great fun to do it. So um, please keep that in mind and tell people when you meet people that you think might want it or they might know somebody. So it's great. All right. Love you guys. Yeah, that is amazing. I, I wouldn't ask you to pray for us as well. I was just talking to Alfred this weekend. And um, one of the things that we've been asking for is, is more food to have access to, to different um, places to distribute. And um, we've been running to try to get Costco um, down in, in Farmington and Bountiful and then here in Riverdale. And so Alfred walked into the Bountiful um, Costco this last week. And he, he really felt like he was supposed to wait until the Lord told him to go. And he went in. And, and the day that he walked in to ask for food, the guys that were managing all of their produce and all of their extra food that, that, that they usually have to get rid of, they were just saying, what are we going to do with all of this food? <laughs> and, and so, um, so he he's secured, he's secured Bountiful. And we're, we're working on Costco at Farmington. We're working, honestly, at, at Costco right here in Riverdale. If we can do that, it's going to just explode our ability to have... Um, a, a greater food outreach here in the northern Utah area. So they're, they're already doing Sandy and Murray and all that, but this was a huge deal for us to be able to secure that. So bless his work. I've got another, um, if you can, if you can find the screen for um, Royal Family Kids Camp, I wanted to make sure. Um, Steve will talk about this. Steve Bain will talk more. This Steve has been doing this camp for years and years and years. And it's, it's a camp that's set up um, to really minister to those who are in foster care. And it is a wonderful program, honestly. And so every year they've been doing Royal Family Kids Camp with all these kids and just giving them an, an incredible encounter, honestly. And, um, and so if you'd like to be a part of that, what he needs is workers. And so the dates are June 27th through July 1st. If, if anybody here um, is a, a registered nurse um, and would like, they need one desperately to be able to work that camp. But you can, you can scan the QR code and it'll take you to a place where you can do an application if you want to. I'm going to leave that up for just a minute. And you can just scan that code on your phone and it'll pull you up to the website or you can pu push in the website at elevation.cc.rfkc or slash rfkc. But um, anyway, it's just a wonderful opportunity and we could be a real huge blessing from our church to be able to have some workers to do that. Um, you can be, I, th I think, a, a, a teenager, but you'll be restricted in what you can do and, and all that. And so you could be a teen to a, an older teen, 14, 15, 16, to be able to do that. But um, the folks that are going to be full-blown counselors will need to, to be um, an adult. So anyway, it's going to be a great thing. I'm going to give Steve opportunity because he's been doing this camp for years next week, and he'll talk about it. But for those who wanted to get an early jump on it and see what's going on, you can just scan the code, so that would be great. All right, how's everybody doing? Good. It's so good to see you. Again, thank you guys with your outreach stuff. That was awesome. And um, um, it just amazes me how things come together. To, to be able to do all that um, with the food that comes in and, and uh, God's just really been good. We've been able to bless a tremendous amount of families through that outreach, so I'm really excited about it. Um, I'm going to jump into a, a message today that the, the title of it um, is that it's time to speak up. It's time to speak up. And I, I wanted to talk with you about it because I, I really do believe that we're in a season right now where 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 every other voice in the planet is raising their voice to declare who they think they are and what they believe and all that. Unfortunately, most of the voices that are coming out and being vocal and loud are taking us in a direction that we don't want to go. And they're taking uh, advantage of the, the sound of their own voice. And I'm finding out that... Um, well, Lance Wall, now I'll put it this way. In a room full of questions... The people who have the answers will lead. Now, it works on both sides of the coin because most people don't really care where they're going, just somebody lead us there. And so it's really imperative that the right voice is being articulated into the airwaves. This thing uh, called the atmosphere that we're in is a really, really big deal because it's in this atmospheric level. The Bible would declare that this is the second heaven level. That's, that's where all of the, the demonic roars, and that's where humanity roars, and that's where, where um, secular humanism roars. But it's also the, the, the territory in which we should roar. And if we don't 
have our voice beginning to project out into this second heaven airways, then the voices that are becoming dominant will be able to be begin to lead the way in what, what people believe and what people think and all of that. And so, um, man alive. The other thing that we're going to have to do is we're going to begin to have to, to take authority over the airwaves so that what is going out is pure and holy and godly and that God would like scramble every other voice. Remember what we prayed this morning? God, let only your voice penetrate my heart. I, I, I accept every voice of the Holy Spirit and I accept everything that the Holy Spirit says, but I renounce every other voice. What would happen if we begin to renounce every other voice that has tried to take advantage of the airwaves that we're living in right now? And so it's a big deal that we begin to pray and earnestly intercede for what is being heard. And because I'm telling you, if you're looking for your, for your truth from, from any kind of news media outlet, I got a sad story for you on that one. You can turn in anyone on any perspective that you want to hear, and, and none of them, I believe, are, are, are telling the truth. There's only one source of truth, and it comes from the word of the Lord, and it comes from the mouth of God. And so it's a real powerful time for you and I to begin to push into a to a place where we properly discern and understand what's going on. The gift of discernment right now is needed more than any other gift on the face of the planet right now because there is so much noise out there that is trying to compete with the voice of God. And if you are not paying attention, you'll believe the voices that are there. Remember, he comes as a deceptor and a deceiver. The Bible says that he is so deceptive that even the very elect could be deceived if it were possible. And, and it's not as long as we're tuned into the Holy Spirit. But if we put things on autopilot and we disengage and we just, I'm telling you, there's so much out there, you'll start be believing the narrative. Once we believe in a narrative that's false, we'll empower that narrative, honestly. And so it's really, really important that we begin to begin to, to speak up and speak out. The other thing that I wanted to, to really push into today, probably, that was just a, an aside, really, mostly. But I wanted to push into the perspective that it's time to speak out about the goodness of God, the truth of God, the love of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ that can change every single person on the planet. I'm telling you, by the end of the service, we're going to give an opportunity for people who are here who need to know him to come to know him. But it will be because there's a clear demonstration and a clear presentation of the truth of God and the love of God manifested in his own story. The kingdom of God manifested through the life of Jesus Christ. And it's time for you and I to grab a hold of that message like never before and begin to declare it and decree it from the mountaintops and the rooftops and the, the malls and the, the elevator shafts that you're in with people. I mean, when you when you got somebody in an elevator, you've got a captive audience, for pity's sake. You know, I, I used to, 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 to ski a lot when I was a kid, and I'd, I, I'd, I'd always ski in the single line, you know, for, for single lift rides because you just grab whoever's, you could go fast, number one. But secondly, I did it because every time I got on a ski chairlift, there was going to be somebody sitting by me that I didn't know. And guess what? We're headed up the hill. Where are you going? Well, I'm going to the top of the hill. No, where are you going? If today, if you fell off and died today, where are you going? You know, and... and you can call it corny if you will, but it's thought-provoking and it brings people into a place to activate their faith and activate what's really going on inside of here. Well, you know what? I really don't know. Well, let me tell you, you've got five minutes before you get to the top. It's a quick presentation, but you can do it. Some of you can't. <laughs> but you can, yeah, yeah. We'll pray for the rest of you that are having difficulty synthesizing, you know. You all know what I'm talking about. Anyway, you're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah. 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 If they're going to die, you better finish the presentation. This is the whole point. So, but it's time. It's time to begin to declare and decree the truth of God and the love of God and begin really caring about humanity enough to speak up. It's time to speak up. It's time to tell the story, his story. Right? Oh, man. Here's, here's the truth of it. Romans 1.16 says it out of the NIV, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. So this whole thing was wrapped up in the ministry of Jesus to bring the nation of Israel into an understanding of why he was there, why he came. But it wasn't exclusively for them. It was for the entire world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Man, we see it in the end zones of almost every sporting event with a big John 316 card up there. How many people, you know, it is the most Googled thing in America in, in around the nations because of these sporting events. What, I wonder what John 316 says. 
I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power. The gospel is the power of God. The message of hope, the message of deliverance, the message of freedom, it comes because of his truth and his love. Yeah. In the Passion Translation, the same verse says this, I refuse to be ashamed of the wonderful message of God's liberating power unleashed in us through Christ. For I am thrilled to preach that everyone who believes is saved. Isn't that good? Yeah. I, I don't know about you, but there have been different seasons in my life where it was easy to share my faith, and then there were other seasons where it was very, very difficult. I will tell you clearly the times when it was difficult to share faith was the times when I felt like my life was compromised. Because a compromised life will always feel like you don't have the right or the privilege or even the ability to share because you don't have, you lack the personal integrity to be able to share the message of the kingdom. Does that make sense to you? And so I, I would say that if we're going to have a message that begins to transform people's lives around us, and if it's time to speak up, the most valuable asset that you can have is a life that's personally been transformed already yourself. It, it, is, it is wonderful to come into a church environment like this where we feel the presence, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. And you can feel there's a corporate level anointing, and it lifts burdens, and it begins to transform and shake your world. But if you don't live that kind of life outside of the house, it doesn't take five milliseconds for it to come back on you to say, who do you think? Because the enemy's voice is, as an accuser is always ready to pounce on your disobedience or to pounce on your failure, right? I mean, he's just like a, a ferocious, you know, animal that wants to devour you. You know, <laughs> that's his description. Like a ferocious animal seeking and desiring to devour each one of us. And his desire is to pounce on your integrity, to pounce on the, the, the places of lack and brokenness. And he wants to convince you and tell you that how can you personally, how can you have a voice that activates faith in others when you haven't got it worked out yourself? Well, he's right, but it doesn't have to stay right. Because it's only one step back into the presence of God. It's one act of humility and confession that brings you back into the sweet place of belonging in a family again of knowing who we are. And when you know who you are, you'll begin to act like who you are. A child of God, a child of the Most High, a king who is able to walk out his life or her life with authority and presence and power. So that when you step into malls or you step, it, it doesn't even begin to be, because I know a lot of people who say, I, I, I can't witness. I'm telling you what, when your life is lived in community and fellowship with God, witnessing isn't something that's a duty or a task or something to be feared. It's a lifestyle because you step into places and people just recognize the goodness of God in you and on you and around you. They can't help it. It's hard to compete with somebody who's happy. Look at the world. How many people do you see that are completely miserable? When you get around somebody that's happy, it's absolutely 100% contagious. I'm telling you, one of the biggest reasons I came to, college, to, to, to Jesus Christ in college was from a girl named Kim Rutt. She was from Torrington, Wyoming. She had absolutely Jesus in her and on her every time I saw her. And when I was around her, and when anyone was around her, it was, like I said, infectious. They didn't want to leave her presence because of the presence of joy that she carried. And so the world is starving for something that looks that real. And they're star But, you know, for me, when I first saw it, I said, that has to be fake. Nobody can be that happy for that long. And so I just kept waiting for the shoe to drop. I kept waiting. Something's got to happen that's got to cause this woman to get... And, and she went through trials. She went through stuff. But even in the midst of hurt and trial and pain... It didn't overcome her joy that's internal because joy is an inside job, remember? Oh, man. And so if we will turn our hearts toward him, have him transform our life, change our life, then when we step out into the world space of community and wokeness and every other thing that's out there, they will begin to see the light of the world shining directly through you and directly through me. This whole thing is about him. And this whole, we get so bound up and tied up with our own internal conflicts and our own stuff that's going around and bills and how are we going to do this or that. And, and we allow all of that to overshadow the goodness of God. 
I'm not saying all of us. I'm saying I'm talking to myself. I've been in seasons where if it wasn't the personal humiliation that I was receiving because of my own lack or because of my own failure, it was the, the, the negativity that jumped on top of me through fear and depression because of the circumstances that surrounded me or that were on me. And I'm telling you, we're just passing through. This whole thing is a life. It's a blip on the radar screen, you know, in terms of, and, and oh, man. I was just telling Nancy yesterday that this whole thing of old age is just really stinky and it's just horrible. Not, not because of my own personal journey, which is true, but I'm talking, I was looking and thinking about the numbers of people that I've, I've watched and loved that they get to these, what should be the greatest years and best years of their entire life and we see sickness and disease and all that begin to take it and rob us from it. And I'm just saying, while you're in great shape and while things are going really well for you, don't take advantage of the time because it's here and it just moves so incredibly quickly. Oh, man. If you've lost both your parents, you'll understand that if you've lost really dear loved ones. I'm, I'm the last, you know, our, our, all of our nieces and nephews of my aunts. And all my aunts and uncles are gone. Not a single one of them, my dad, their whole 11 kids and all of them gone. It's crazy. <laughs> the most glorious part of it is that, you know, we're just passing through. It's not like it's the end of the story. Most of them I was able to lead personally to Jesus Christ along the journey. And so that's really incredibly powerful. My point is, is that you have one life to spend. We, each one of us, just one. This is the only opportunity that we have to glorify Jesus in an earthly tent with all of the constrictions, with all of the junk, with everything that's going around us. We have one opportunity, one span of life to just give him everything. Oh, man, I'm, I'm completely broken for some of the areas that I wasted or some of the areas that I just completely blew because I was so selfish with my own heart, my own desires. But I'm telling you, the closer you move toward the goalpost, the, the more it aligns your heart. The more your heart longs to be with him, the more your heart longs for him. There are not nearly as many distractions that seem as important when you're 57 or 58 as it did when I was 24. Just saying. Yeah. For I refuse to be ashamed of the wonderful, the wonderful message of Jesus Christ and his liberating power to unleash in us through Christ. His wonderful power, look at that. His wonderful power is unleashed in us. It's like he takes us off the chain and says, go get them. Just, just, just go get them. Everything you need, just, I'm, I'm taking you, you're unleashed. Go, go, go. In, in the negative, I think of like a pit bull, you know. Take him off the chain. What's he going to He's going to do what he was bred to do. In the kingdom, when we take you off the chain, you get to do what you were created to do. And that's to evangelize the entire world. We've, we've been at, out of Proverbs 28, verse, I think it's one. Um, we've been talking about this verse for quite a while, but it, I want to speak at it one more time just to illustrate the, the need for us to live lives that are whole lives that are not compromised. It says, the wicked, when, the wicked flee when no man pursues them, but the uncompromisingly righteous are as bold as a lion. The wicked flee when no one pursues them. What does it mean? Like paranoia. You know, they're just always, always worried about something. They're, they just run, they run, they run, they run, they run. But the uncompromisingly righteous are as bold as a lion. One, one translation says, bold as a ferocious young lion. And I'm telling you what, that's the kind of Jesus that we need inside of us. But the reason that we're bold as, an un, un, bold as a lion is that we live an uncompromised, righteous life. That's the only way that boldness can come. Because when we're whole, we will live in a manner worthy of the one that called Jesus Christ in our lives. Yeah. 1 John chapter 4, verse 15 out of the Amplified Classic says this, Anyone who confesses, acknowledge, owns that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides, lives, makes his home in him, and he abides, lives, and makes his home in God. 
anyone who confesses that Jesus is Lord, it means that he'll come and live in us. To confess means to publicly identify with. It's a verbal identification, but it's also a spiritual partnership between us and Christ. I think of Peter's confession when Jesus turns directly to him and says, Peter, who do you say that I am? When Jesus arrived in the villages, this is out of Matthew chapter 16, verse 11, or Matthew 16, verses 13 and following. Listen to this out of the message. When Jesus arrived in the village of Caesarea in Philippi, he asked his disciples, what are people saying about who the Son of Man is? And here's where the answer is. They replied, some think that he is John the baptizer, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah, and or one of the other prophets. Verse 15, he pressed them, and how about you? Who do you say that I am? And listen to verse 16. Simon, Simon Peter said, you're the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter pops up, you're the Christ, you're the Messiah, you're the Son of the living God. Jesus came back in verse 17, he says, God bless you, Simon, son of Jonah. You didn't get that answer out of books or from teachers. My Father in heaven, God himself, let you in on the secret of who I really am. Now listen to this. And now I'm going to tell you who you really are. Who? A personal revelation of who Jesus is to us creates in us a new identity so that we know who we really are. Now I'm going to tell you, Simon Peter, son of Jonah, who you really, really are. Listen to this. You are Peter, a rock. Je Jesus himself is described as Petra, the big rock. But he says, you are Petros, a smaller rock. It's like you're a chip off the old block is what I'm telling you. Who I am, you are. You are Peter, a rock. This is the rock on which I will put together my church, a church so expansive with energy that not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. Now listen to this. I love Eugene Peterson's message. And that's not all. You will have complete and free access to God's kingdom. Keys to open up any and every door. Are you listening? This is who we become when we become a born-again believer. We begin to resonate and carry the same authority in which he is. You're, you're, I, I am Petra. You're Petros. You're just a chip. You're exactly, you've been created to look like me. You will have complete and free access. Everybody say free access. <laughs> to what? God's kingdom. You'll be given keys to open any and every door. No more barriers between heaven and earth, earth and heaven. A yes on earth is a yes in heaven. A no on earth is a no in heaven. Other translations, it says it'll give you the power and the ability to bind up and to loose. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose from heaven will be loose to the earth. But in every and all authority now has been given to you. Jesus himself, he says before he goes, he says, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, because I have authority, he, he, he makes the implication clear, you have authority. All authority has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And he says, I'll be with you always, even to the very end of the age. This is the kind of kingdom that we were birthed into and, and born into when we said yes. I love what Simon Peter goes through. <laughs> you didn't hear that from any teacher. You didn't hear it and read it from any book. Only the Father himself revealed to you that I am the Messiah, the Son of God. Now that you know who I am, let me tell you who you are. Who you really, really are. If you've been struggling with an identity issue in Christ 
an understanding of, of who you really are, then you need to pay a real close attention to this because Simon Peter was just a person just like you and I. He went through all the kinds of difficulties that you and I go through. He struggled with impetuousness. He struggled with all of the, the issues that wanted to easily beset his life. And yet, here he is. You're a rock. Oh, man. My computer keeps going to sleep. There it is. Now it went completely asleep. Some of you will have to teach me how to keep it awake sometime. But yeah. And now I'm going to tell you who you are. You are Peter, a rock. This is a rock on which I will put my church together with. A church so expansive with energy that not even the gates of hell would be able to keep it out. The reason I say that it's time to speak up and speak out is that we've got a lot of voices that are seemingly louder than the voice of the church and there's a complacency that's built into the body of Christ in recent years so that the church has learned to fit in, not to overcome, and to be setting the tone for who we are and where we're going. The reason it's also important, because we've been talking over the last several weeks and months, honestly, that what God is bringing, remember Bobby Connor was here last year, and he said that God's bringing in a wind that will blow away all the chaff and to put out all the trash in our region. The chaff is the things, honestly, in our life that we need to have sifted and blown away. If you guys are familiar with harvesting, you'll take grain, and they will, they will literally beat it and beat it and beat it to where it, the, the chaff is separated from the grain. And then they'll throw the hole up into the wind and into the air, and with a light breeze, all of the chaff is blown away. And what falls back to the earth is the grain of precious value. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing right now around the nations. I was heartbroken again this weekend to read of another main, I mean a main, main, mainstream leader in the body of Christ who had to completely resign his church because of issues in his own personal life that got in the way of, of him being able to fulfill the calling of God in his life. In the years where he should be most powerfully used and carries the wisdom and the authority because of, of years of really successful ministry, a few moments and a few mistakes cause him to be able to have to turn in a resignation for a worldwide, worldwide in, influence. Now, I'm, I'm really serious with you. God is going to bring transformation and shaking to the nations, but it will first begin with the house of the Lord. I promise you that God is shaking things up and stirring things not to harm us, but to purify us back to the place of pure love and pure holiness so that our voice can be heard. Because quite honestly, if we live compromised lifestyles, lifestyles when we declare our voice, they say, oh, I don't believe that voice at all. I have no trust in that voice because I can see all of the complications in that person's life and the lack of integrity and the lack of morality and the lack, I'm telling you, he's going to do it with leaders, but he's going to do it in the pews in which we live. And so this is not a time to toy around with God saying, ah, it's not a big deal. I can live any way I want to. God's grace is good. His love is good. His grace is kind, and it's always sufficient to cover me and wash over me. And I'm telling you, that's not grace. That's the same kind of doctrine and mess that the Gnostics got into where they separated everything out and said, we can do what we want to because God's good and he loves us. Mm. The kind of grace that God talks about is a grace that causes us to repent. The kind of grace that God talks about is a grace that purifies us and draws us back into relationship. It is an unbelievably overwhelming grace that will pull somebody who's completely outside of love and completely outside of covenant and to still extend that kind of love to pull you back into relationship. The grace of God was intended to pull you out of the world and into the kingdom. The grace of God was intended to pull us out of all kinds of compromise into a place where we're fully known by him. And it's a redefinition of our identity like Peter went through. It says, huh, now let me tell you who you really, really are. And the voice of the Father begins to resonate and burn deep inside of you, realigning your purpose and your value because you begin to understand, no, I'm not that person. That's the activity that I've been into, but it's not who I was created to be. And I won't continue to walk in that kind of nonsense any longer. I won't continue to walk in a lifestyle because the uncompromisingly bold, righteous are as bold as a lion. And I've determined in my heart, I've determined in my mind who I will serve. Choose this day who you will serve, the Lord, the Lord of the Lord says. And this is the season, it's the time. God 
is shaking the nations of the earth. He's shaking us. For those that don't believe that there's a judgment of heaven upon the earth, look around. Oh, God wouldn't do that. He doesn't have to. We created our own mess and we suffer the consequences of the actions of our, of our abandonment of the kingdom of God in the nations. Whenever the, whenever the righteous rule, the people rejoice. How many righteous do we have ruling in the nations? That's why we're under judgment is we've laid down the ability for us to have a powerful voice because we've just abdicated our responsibility to say, let it fall on somebody else's watch. It's time to speak up. It's time to begin to declare and decree that this planet is worth saving. Let's don't de develop a defeatist mentality where we just bury our head in the sand and say, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming. And meanwhile, we let all of the world go to hell in a handbasket because we refuse to raise our voice except to say, I'm just going to hold on till Jesus comes. I'm just going to wait. I'm just going to wait. Wait and watch, wait and watch. How about wait, watch, and pray? How about wait, watch, and declare? How about standing out on the street corners and begin to declare the truth of God in the streets? Truth has fallen in the streets, is waiting for someone to come and declare the goodness of God. Because you've been given a kingdom that's of, of, of just indispensable value. You've been given authority to be able to declare and decree and to watch atmospheres shake and devils run. Come on. It's time. It's time that we begin to take up who he really is in us and for us to know who we really are. If you're struggling with identity, it's time to get over it. <laughs> It's just, it's just time. It's nonsense because you've been given the words of life and the truth of the kingdom that transforms everything. It's just time to make a shift internally to begin to believe who he says you are and begin walking it out daily in your life. I am. I am a child of the king. So don't, here's what Timothy says, so don't be embarrassed to speak up for our master or for me, his prisoner. Take that to heart. All over the world, there are people who are dying and literally dying going into prisons and being beaten for the cause of Jesus Christ right now. Martyrs who are suffering for the namesake of Jesus Christ. We have, I can't even talk to you because it's online. Just let me say, in a certain part of the world, there are people that we know that we've personally ministered to who got brutally beaten last, last week. Four pastors got brutally beaten because they refused to be silent. So don't be embarrassed to speak up about the master or be embarrassed for me, his prisoner. Take your share of the suffering for the message along with the rest of us. Whew. Why should we be any different than them? Why should our message of faith or the message of hope result in something? Because we've made it so tepid that nobody's challenged by the voice that we declare. We don't upset devils or we don't upset politicians. We don't upset ruled leaders because we just say, oh, I won't want to do that. I don't want to be controversial. Why? The whole, the whole thing. He came not to bring peace but to bring a sword, to bring a dividing rod. Now, I'm not talking about a sword of violence. The sword of truth, the word of God that will divide and separate out the holy from the unholy. It's time. It's time to speak up. Uh, this, this conflict that's happening in, in, in Ukraine, I, I can't even tell you how much I applaud people who don't even know Jesus, who are standing in the, they're standing in their, in their city courts and in the cities of Russia and they're beginning to declare, this is wrong. It's wrong. And immediately they get cuffed and they take taken to jail. They say, worth it. Worth it. If you think that that kind of thing can't happen in the United States, you're wrong. I'm telling you, we're this close away from losing all the freedoms that we've so viciously fought for and so fer ferociously begin to defend the truth that's in this nation. <sighs> Wokeness won't fix this world, but an awakening will. Amen. So don't be embarrassed to speak up for our master, for me, his prisoner. Take your share of the suffering for the message along with the rest of us. We can only keep on going after all by the power of God who first saved us and then called us to his holy work. We had nothing to do with it. 
It was all his idea. This is out of 2 Timothy 1, chapter 8 through 10, by the way. We had nothing to do about it. It was all his idea, a gift prepared for us in Jesus long before we knew anybody knew anything about it. But we know it now. And since the appearance of our Savior, nothing could be plainer. Death defeated, life vindicated in a steady blaze of light all through the work of Jesus. Let me read that again. But we know about it now. Since the appearance of our Savior, nothing could be plainer. Death was defeated. Life was vindicated in a steady blaze of light all through the work of Jesus Christ. This is the message that I've been set apart to proclaim as a preacher, an emissary, and a teacher. It's also the cause of all this trouble that I'm in. But I have no regrets. I couldn't be more sure of my ground. The one I've trusted in can take care of what he's trusted me to do right to the very end. Do you get that? This message that I've been set apart to proclaim as a preacher, an emissary teacher, it also is the cause of all this trouble that I'm in. I remember when the early church were thrown into prison and they were thrown in, you know. <laughs> remember that thing that got us into all that trouble? One of them says, they said, yep. Lord, we ask that you bring more. All the signs, the wonders, and miracles that caused them to be isolated, that caused them to be beaten. Lord, all that stuff that got us into all that trouble. Lord, would you bring more of that same stuff? Because it's the only thing that changes the world. This is the message I've been set apart to proclaim as a preacher, an emissary, or a teacher. It is also the cause of all the trouble I'm in, but I have no regrets. Come on. Could somebody just say, can I live my life in such a manner that when I close my eyes at the end of this age and I enter into heaven, I can look back and say, no regrets. That doesn't mean you didn't have problems or issues. It means that you've reconciled all of those differences and all of that white noise that's been troubling you and you've put it under the blood of Christ so that the one who started a good work in you is faithful to bring it to a completion. You say, I, I'm not going to allow my past to define me. I'm not going to allow my past to rule over me. I'm not going to allow my past failures to say who I am because once it's under the blood, it's under the blood and it's forgiven. Remember, we just did this last week. But the blood of Christ purifies us, cleanses us, makes us righteous and makes us holy so that we're fit for the work of the King. I have no regrets. I couldn't be more sure of my ground. The one I've trusted in can take care of what he's trusted me to do right to the very end. I feel like I need to activate this in us, that we would just posture our hearts to say, God, you can trust me. If, if, you, if you mean it and you're willing to, to step into a place where you want to have transformation, just put your hand over your heart and say, God, what you've entrusted me, Lord, I want. I, I, I covenant with you that you can trust me to the very end. I won't walk away from your gift. I won't walk away from your calling. I won't walk away from you. I won't walk away from relationship because you're everything. I love you and I need you. Right to the very end. Right to the very end. Our culture, man, I'm telling you, they're living a life that's large and proud and unashamed. I, I can't even believe some of the things that I'm seeing right now with, you know, and, and remember, we're not talking about people, but we're talking about the silliness of secular humanism and how far it'll take us. Where we're willing to let someone say, I identify as a female, so I'm going to compete in all female athletics and be able to do what I want now. I mean, Forget whether you believe that they're sincere. Sincerity has nothing to do with it. I mean, I grew up in a world of drag racing. There's, there's stock, there's pro stock, there's comp, there's fuel ejected stuff. If I'm, if I'm competing in stock, I can't bring a pro comp fuely car into the comp world, into the stock world. Does that make sense to anybody? We disqualify you because you have an unfair advantage. Where is the wisdom gone? Forget whether they didn't. We, we, if that's what you want to be, 
bless you, celebrate you, all that stuff, kumbaya. You still don't get to do everything you want to do just because you decide that you want to do it. Cindy McGill come in and straighten me out on all this next week or whenever she comes. <laughs> yeah, she does. She posts, yeah. You, we just affirm them in their madness and affirm them in their sickness when they allow them to do this stuff. That's why we have to have a voice. We sit back and we say, well, I don't want to create any ruckle. They'll think that I'm a, a, a hater. They'll think I'm one of these people who, you know, is a, is a homophobe or this kind of thing and that kind of thing. And I'm telling you, no. Somebody needs to stand up and say wrong is wrong. Hmm. Look at this out of John chapter 12, verses 42 and 43 out of the Passion. It says this, John chapter 12, beginning with verse 42. Yet there were many Jewish leaders who believed in Jesus... But listen to this. But because they feared the Pharisees, they kept it secret. So they wouldn't be ostracized by the assembly of the Jews. For they loved the glory that men could give them rather than the glory that came from God. <coughs> Excuse me. For they loved the glory that men could give them rather than the glory that came from God. Oh, man, this is the big deal right now why so many ministries in the nations right now are being sifted because they bought into that false belief of adulation that comes from the, the voice of other men. And you, oh. Anytime that there's an anointing, the anointing will make way for you, but it's only personal integrity that will keep you there. And when your gifting is larger than your foundation of personal integrity, you're in a head-on collision with failure and, and calamity, honestly. Nancy and I have been talking about this because it's easy as pastors to be the voice, the one that people hear, the one that are up front, the one, that, and I'm telling you what, it's vital, vital that anybody that's leading have people around them that can see into their lives and to be able to comment and bring commentary into their lives. It's absolutely essential that you have people around you who can speak truth into you and tell you, hey, I don't know what's going on, but something's going on. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but let's talk. And that you develop relationships with people where you give people permission to be editors in your life. People who are not trying to, to find fault in you so that they can ruin you, but people who want to edit you to make you better. Does that make sense? It's absolutely vital for you to have those people in your life because you can isolate yourselves into places where you get to do what you want and you think that nobody knows what you're doing. But the longer that you do things in secret, the more that they'll become public. Because the Bible is absolutely true. You can be sure that your sins will what? Find you out. Oh. They didn't want to be ostracized by the assembly of the Jews, for they loved the glory of men that was given to them rather than the glory that came from God. They knew Jesus, but they feared the Pharisees. What does it look like for us to know Jesus but to fear all of these other pluralistic voices that are around us telling us to shut up and sit down and be quiet? Oh, don't say anything. You can't, you can't be in the comment to that because people will think you're a hater. I'm telling you, you can bring truth in love, but it still needs to be presented. Truth still must be presented because if we don't, we become complicit in the sentence of death that's going to lay upon their heads when the, when the reaper comes. When judgment comes, that's the other thing that we need to begin declaring and decreeing in the streets. Hell is a real place. And the consignment of those who don't love God is a real thing. It's real. I've heard it spoken over and over again. How could I trust a God or love a God that would consign people to hell? Because he's a God of love, but he's also a God of justice. And because everything in life and creation has been given for everyone in humanity to have a choice and a place to come into the knowledge of the goodness of God. Romans chapter 1 says it this way, that everyone has been given the nature and the goodness of God and the message of God through even creation that's been created. All of creation, it says, testifies. Everything, you can't, seriously. People who, 
have a brain. You look at this miracle of the planet Earth and everything that happens. You look at the miracle of a little baby that's being born. You look at the miracle of a calf dropping out on the ground. And you say, that all happened by happenstance or chance, by some primordial ooze that crawled up off of the bank of the water and began to develop legs. Come on, give me a break. Everything in this world is a testimony giving glory to the creator who formed it and made it. It says that the Bible declares this, that all of creation is crying out, looking for the sons of daughter to come and testify about who he really is. That's why your voice must be heard, because you know you've been given the truth. Now begin to testify about his goodness, testify about his love, so that all creation, it says, is without excuse. How can, how can God consign? It's, again, it's not the heart of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that who would ever believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. It looks to me that's a pretty inclusive plan. He loved the whole world so that nobody would perish. Anybody who perishes refused and rejected the message of hope that would bring them life. God's not consigning anyone we willingly, through our own rebellion and disobedience, say, forget you, God. And we do our own thing. And we shake our fist at God. Or we get hurt, we get wounded, we get offended at God because one of our loved ones died. And we prayed a prayer and it didn't happen. Not realizing that life is a blip. We're only here for a moment. Eternity is forever. It's time. It's time to wake up. It's time to declare. It's time to decree. Because the blood of those who will perish could possibly be on your hands and mine if we stood in the place where we could have provided the hope and we chose not to because we were more concerned about the voice of the Pharisees than the voice of God. More, more concerned about the voice of, of, of a political leader or a subculture or an office environment. We're, we're, we're going to stand. We're going to stand accountable for every missed opportunity. You'll have, there'll be blood on our hands. Oh, Jesus, help us. Don't let the fear of people be larger than your fear of the Lord. That's the point. We need to be those who are confessing Christians. Romans chapter 10 verse 9 says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 and 33 says, Therefore, everyone who acknowledges me before men and confesses me out of a state of oneness with me, I will also acknowledge him before my Father who is in heaven and confess that I am abiding in him. But whoever denies me and disowns me before men, I will also deny and disown him before the Father who is in heaven. Romans 14, verses 8 and 9 out of the NIV. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For Christ died and lived again for this very purpose, that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. And then finally, the truth of the matter is, is that we will confess him whether we want to or not. There's coming a day either voluntarily or by compulsion, that we will confess that he is Lord of Lords. For Philippians 2, chapter 10, verse 11, 10, chapter 2, verse 10 and 11 says that at the same, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Lord, to God be the Father. Oh, man. I'd, I'd much rather be on the proactive side of seeing lives change than to be on the back end of wondering how I'm going to make it at the end. You know? I, 
I also want to make sure that you all understand I'm not trying to beat anybody up, but I am trying to rattle your cage and wake us up. There's a difference. Because beating it up would tell you that you're just a worthless piece of trash and you'll never amount to anything. So why try? But a wake-up call will call you into the thing that you were called to be. Wonderful, righteous, holy, victorious. Wherever we find ourselves on the, the whole grade scale of, of how we've summed up our life, we can all be better, is what I'm saying. We all can yield more and, and devote ourselves to more. I'm going to finish with this text out of, out of Luke chapter 6, verse 46. It's out of Peterson's, the message again. It says, why are you so, pol so polite with me? Always saying, yes, sir, and that's right, sir, but never doing the thing I tell you. <laughs> why are you always so polite? Do you, have, you know what I'm talking about? Where, where you just get into the religiosity thing and, oh, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, bless you. And, and here's what he's saying. Why are you so polite with me? Always saying, yes, sir. That's right, sir. But never doing the thing I tell you. These words I speak to you are not just mere additions to your life. Homeowner improvements to your standard of living. They are foundation words. Words to build your life upon. We're not just trying to remodel some back bedroom. You know? Not just trying to have a little fixer-upper so that we can bring people over and see the, the grand entrance. We went into a hotel like this in Ukraine when we were there. Oh, man, you walk through the front doors, and it looked like you were in the Taj Mahal. It looked like a five-star place. It looked absolutely... Do you remember this, Linda? It, it, was, it was crazy beautiful. And then you ride the elevator up, and you open up the doors, and it was post-war Europe, or pre-war Europe and post-war Europe all put together. It, had, it hadn't been touched in probably 80 years. Yeah. And, and you open up the door, and you look at what's going on. The wallpaper, I promise, was there in the 1920s. Yeah. It was 20s era wallpaper. Nothing had been touched. The beds were so incredibly gross, we've laid out all of our dirty clothes that we had with us on the bed and slept on top of our dirty clothes because there was no way we were going to touch those things on that bed. The shower, you turn the water on the shower and nothing but pure rust comes out, which isn't the end of the world. But then you know that there's people above you because the showers are stacked one upon the other and the floors are rotted out and now the rust from the previous floor is coming down on top of you through the, all the junk of the rafters. And it was rough. And I fear that many times we have entrances that we put out as a public facade for people that look like that Taj Mahal experience. But then when we ride the elevator <laughs> and the doors open, the real truth is revealed about what's really going on underneath the covers, if you know what I'm saying. Now we're not, Paul was saying this, he says we're not just trying to remodel a little entryway so that you can look good. We're trying to get to the very foundation so that you can build your life on a foundation that looks like the entryway. So that the hole that you're building looks like what you're trying to present as the thing that's great and wonderful. We have a real problem in America where we'll begin to segment our lives off into categories and we want to present our very, that's why social media is so deceptive because people can present everything on social media. Everybody looks good on a date. You can, you can hold yourself together and look really good on a single date and make people think that you're the most miraculous thing on the planet. And then date number two comes along you say, oh, Houston, we've got a problem. <laughs> this, this thing they're presenting is not, one of these things is not like the other. You know, that's another one. But if we have cultures that are hidden and cultures that don't allow for true vulnerability where people can really begin to tell who they are, then we will hide all of our junk and present only our best and people will think that we're good. I'm telling you, God is not laughing and he's not skipping and he's not winking his eyes saying, oh, it's going to be all right. I know your heart. That's the problem. He knows our heart. <laughs> We're out of the abundance of the heart. The mouth will speak. That's one of the things that happens. I'm just saying. We're in awakening. This is an awakening. 
Happy to be three, which is awakening. Yeah. Come on. It's just time. It's time. It's time for you to make your voice count. It's time for your voice to matter. It's time for when things begin to stir up by the voice of the Spirit inside of you and you say, well, I better not say anything. It'll just get me in trouble. I'm, I mean, there's some wisdom in some of that. I will say that. <laughs> but most people will hide the fear inside of them and call it wisdom. Well, I can't say anything. Might get me fired. That or a promotion. One or the other. At least you've been true to yourself. I'm not saying that you say things to be mean. I'm just saying that sometimes you need to speak out regardless of what the consequences look like and trust that God will take care of you. Could it be that hiding in the place of silence and hiding in the place of fear is the thing that's kept you out of your promotion? Because I can't stir the boat, can't rock, can't stir the boat. I'm mixing my metaphors. I do that all the time. Can't stir the boat. No, I can't rock the boat. I do it all the time. I make up stuff. I'll tell you what I did yesterday. Just hold on. This is going to be a good one. My wife's been having chest pain and she didn't know what it's from. I'm just going to tell you. It's so funny. I'll stop there. I'm not going to tell you now. I can't. You were the one that was going to post it on Facebook. Not about me. Oh. <laughs> okay, I'll stop. <laughs> it was funny, though, I will tell you that. It was we'll leave you to wonder. <laughs> and, and pray for me. Because... <laughs> I'm about to incur the wrath of, <laughs> how could you possibly think that that was acceptable? <sighs> I'm coming over here. <laughs> yeah, I think you shouldn't say everything that comes up on the screen. This was probably a good example of that, but we just celebrated 33 years, so we've, we've lived through a lot of moments like that one right there. <laughs> But, well, she's lived through a lot of moments like that one. But, oh, man. <laughs> How do I get out of this now is the question. Preach my sermon. That would be a good idea. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. <laughs> uh, yes. It's what happens when you're mixing metaphors. That's how this got started. Yeah. It's like you, you can't stir the boat, you know. Yeah. You, you take things out of context, it'll all get, like, like the, 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 the message that says, you know, and Judas went out and hanged himself, and then you pull something obscurely out of the text someplace else. Go and do that likewise, you know. You know, it, I'm still experiencing it right now. <laughs> Jesus, help me. Well, in heaven you'll hear the story. So. <laughs> nah, they probably will. Yeah. So anyway, everybody stand. I can't do anything more to wrap this thing up now. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Laughter does do good like a medicine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I hope that you'll take at heart some of the things that came out in today's message. That the hour is critical. And the need for us to be real true ambassadors of Jesus Christ has never been greater. And the need to speak truth in a land that doesn't want to hear it is absolutely essential because truth is the only thing that will set people free. 
Bobby says this, it says, if you go into the doctor and you've got a problem with your liver and he says there's something wrong with your arm, you better get a different doctor. Because we can't afford another day of misdiagnosis for the planet that we're living on. We try to tell somebody to fix something that we think will make them feel better, but it doesn't fix the real root problem of the issue. And so we try to tame the message down so that we can be more compliant or more received. And we come this far away from really telling them the truth. And because we don't really tell them the truth, they stay bound in their junk. I'm saying that there is a world that don't want to hear what we have to say, but that doesn't mean that we should silence our voice just because they don't want to hear it. Because the more we silence our voice, the more louder their voice will become. They are going to do their very best to define what the world that they live in looks like, and they want a world that looks like them. And it's time for you and I to begin to just, in love, but with real conviction and passion and mercy, begin to bring a clarion call that brings people back to the hope of glory, Jesus Christ himself. There's some right now in this room who your life's been conflicted and you've been trying to figure out, you've been like a ping pong ball bouncing around from ideology to ideology to ideology, religious view to religious view, and you're saying, I've tried this, I've tried that, I don't even know, I don't even know what's right now, but I'm telling you, in the preaching of the word today, you heard a message that's true and the reason you know it's true is because your heart began to come alive under the preaching of the word. The Spirit of God is bringing revelation, and it's bringing a conviction of your heart that you've never even felt before. And you say, oh, man, there's something different about that voice. There's something different about that word and that message. And it's because it's full of truth, and it's full of hope, and it's full of glory. And so if you've been ping-pong balling around trying to figure out what's right, what's true, I promise you that the word that Jesus Christ himself brings about who he is is 100% true. And what he did to Peter, he'll do to you. When you acknowledge who he is, and when you say, Jesus, you are the Son of God, the Messiah, the one who brings life, he'll turn right back around to you and says, okay, John, okay, Bill, okay, Nancy, let me tell you who you are, really, who you really are. And he'll, he'll in a moment put identity back into your heart so that you know you know, I'm born again. You'll know I'm safe. You'll know you're forgiven. You'll know that you're redeemed. Man. Who wouldn't want that? Who wouldn't want to be able to settle the issue of where I'm going at the end of this world? Who wouldn't want to settle the issue of knowing that your sins have been completely forgiven because of your right alignment with the king? And so if that's you, and you need to know him, and you're the one who's been ping-ponging, and we're the one that's been questioning all of this stuff, and you want to know him in this way, you can come forward right now, and you can have your whole identity rewired in Jesus Christ. And he too will call you a rock, a chip off the old block. Do you want him? Do you long for that kind of transformation? Come and get him right now. Don't. Don't even hesitate on what it might look like to others because every single one of us that have come to Jesus have walked down a similar path to get there. Every one of us have had to confess with our mouth that he is the Son of God, the Lord. And every single one of us have had to say yes to him. And it's not a walk of shame or humiliation. It's a walk of victory and hope. The first step that you take out into the aisle is a chain breaker that breaks chains off your life and you get to walk into freedom. If you need him, come and get him. Please don't put it off another hour. Don't put it off another day. He's yours completely. You can have him. Come and get him. Huh. I want to sing that song, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. If that's what you want him to do in your heart, you've never done it, just come forward with the profession and the confession of your own mouth, Holy Spirit, Jesus, you're welcome here in my heart. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. If you need him, come and get him. Don't put it off. Just come up and meet me right here. God's going to change your life.
some others who need to respond and you're just waiting come on don't wait another moment you can have him here today and now just come and get him come on that's so good come on thanks for coming oh isn't that amazing come on there's others I know come on your prayers Just, just another moment. I just feel like I need to hold up. I'll throw for another moment. Come on, you can have it. Come and get it. Yeah. Huh. Oh, come on. Anybody else? Anybody else? Do this with me, church. Would you celebrate those that have come? Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on, we can do better now. Come on. Yeah, God. Yeah, God. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. I tell you what I'm really impressed with is like, most time when people come down, they come out and they stay forward and they don't want anybody to see them. You guys all came down, just turned right toward everybody and come said, on. Here we are. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Here we are. And I'm telling you, it's a big deal because it's not a place of shame and it's not a place yeah. of fear. This is a place of personal, life giving hope and transformation. This is like one of the very best days you'll ever experience when you say yes to Jesus because what the Bible says is that He takes all of your old junk, all the sin, all of the stuff that you've been tangled up in and he takes all of that shame and he lifts it off and here's what he says he blows it completely away from your life and he says I'll blow it away as far as the east is from the west they never meet and I'll never remember your past sins against you ever again that's a pretty big deal it's like because we wrestle with stuff that we did and we just keep waking up every morning and say oh man I just feel so bad about what I did and we beat ourselves up and the enemy's always accusing the Bible says he's accuser of the brothers and sisters of God and day and night night and day he just keeps saying you're lousy you're a sinner you know he just keeps bombarding our mind and Jesus cracks it and he blows it away and when the enemy comes back then tomorrow and say hey that thing you did yesterday that was just emotionalism you still remember he remembers. God doesn't. You need to remind him. Say, no, that's not who I am. That's who I used to be. I have a memory of it, but the memory has no pain in me any longer because he's forgiven me, he's liberated me, and he has set me free. I can't be held accountable for something that Jesus forgave me for. Right, come on. I can't pay a sentence and do the crime, do the time for the crime when Jesus already did the time. Right, come on. He already paid the price. He died on a cross so that we could have complete, total, 100% forgiveness. So that when the enemy comes, he stands up like a big, tall lawyer and stands between us and says, nope, nope, he's acquitted. There's no, there's no thing that can be held against him any longer. I paid the price. He's completely free. The debt was paid in full. That's what he says. Pretty, pr pretty miraculous and fantastic, honestly. And so tomorrow when... Everything wants to come back in on you like a flood. Temptations want to come. You just need to remind him, nope, that's not who I am anymore. Doesn't mean you'll never have a problem, you'll never fall, you'll never do anything. No, you probably will and you can, but here's what it means. When you do fail, you're going to know exactly where to go in a heartbeat. When your heart is convicted by the Holy Spirit, which he will, when you begin to do something out of line, he'll call you right back and say, hey, don't do that. That's not going to be good for you. And you can just say, yes, Lord Jesus, I'm not going to do that anymore. You can yield your heart to him and say, Lord, forgive me for that. I'm so sorry. And you can realign your heart. And with that act of confession, he'll absolutely forgive you and move you on. 
You're going to mature every single day if you'll just stick close to him. Every day is going to look better and better and better. doesn't mean it's going to be full of like daisies and roses with no problems in your life. You're going to still have problems. You're just going to be like that girl like Joy, or Kim Rutt who has so much joy in you that it's like you, you laugh at your circumstance. Internal joy takes over all of the outward stuff that you're going through. And so I want you all to pray with me. That those of you that came to church, you just pray out loud with me. Jesus, come into my heart today. Forgive me. Change my heart. Change my life. I confess with my mouth that you are the Lord. You are the Savior. Jesus, you're the Messiah. And you paid my debt so that I could walk in freedom. You've taken away my sin because of my confession of faith. And now, Jesus, I give you the rest of my heart and I give you my whole life. I want to walk with you. I want you to walk with me. I want you to do what you did to Peter. I want you to call me who I now am. Call me by a new name. I am a chip off this old block. I am like this rock that's attached to you. Yeah, Jesus, you have permission to guide every part of my life now. I give it my whole life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, church. Yeah. I love that baby. Yeah. Here's, <laughs> he's saying, what's going on? <laughs> yeah. Here's, here's what I want to challenge you with now, if you guys will just stick with me for just another moment longer. Because here's, here's what I know about Christianity. It's, it's never been best lived alone. It's never been really powerful or uh, real authority, authority driven in your life when you're trying to live it out in a context of not having community with other people in the body of Christ. I, I mean, I, I did this my first several months of Christ. I got saved, but I still wanted to keep one foot in the world and one foot, you know, in the kingdom. And so I, I said, me and Jesus, we got our own thing going. And so I'd go try to live like the rest of the world was doing, but Jesus was inside of me. And so what was happening is I was completely miserable because Jesus was in me. <laughs> And so when the change happened is when I began to make community with other brothers and sisters in Christ and said, I'm in. Some of that meant that I had to say goodbye to some relationships that were destructive in my life. I'm telling you, anybody that's going to pull you away from hope, pull you away from truth, and drag you into something that's ugly and looks like sin and is sin, you can't afford to have those people in your life. It doesn't mean you don't love them. It just means you're going to have to distance yourself from them for a season so that they don't have more influence on you than you do on them. Does that make sense? And so I'm telling you, you may have to rearrange some of your relationships. If some of these people may be real close family members. It doesn't mean you don't love them. You're going to be kind. You're going to be polite. But you're not going to run with them and make them to be the, the most powerful thing in your life. You're going to let Jesus author new relationships in your life that will pull you into love. You know, we're, we're not trying to, 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 to run your life, honestly. But we want you to succeed in your new life with God. We want you to be around people who will encourage you and strengthen you and lift you up. That's it. Who, when you're going through problems, you can say, hey, I really need some help. I'm going through a difficult time. And they'll get down in the trench with you and love you and pray with you, help you walk through difficulties together. And so um, there's a lot of those people right behind you in this room. There's a ton of people who can help you. If you're looking for someone to pour into your life and someone to be like a father or a mother spiritually to you, you can ask the Lord, who is that supposed to be? And then go ask them and say, would you help me? pretty good chance they will. I'd say it's more than a high likelihood if the Lord tells you who it is. Say, Lord, I need help on this new journey. Would you show me who I'm supposed to connect to? And then just go ask them, hey, I just got saved a couple weeks ago at church or whatever, and I need help with my new walk with God. Would you help me do that? Here's my phone number. Would you call me or can I call you? Come on. Does that make sense? Yeah. Don't walk out of this place feeling alone is what I'm saying. You have family. These people behind me are some of the greatest people on the planet, and they'll love you to the end of the earth and back. And they'll accept you. And even when you fail, they won't put a, 
a condemned sign over your head. They'll say, come on, let's just do this over. You get to do it over. Jesus loves you. He forgives you. Then they'll ask the question, are you done? Done. <laughs> yeah, I'm done. Okay, then let's just pick up the pieces and move on. Okay? Okay, all right. We love you. Um, Philip, would you do me a favor and grab some, some visitor cards and just take these folks into the next room and just have them, I'll fill out one for me because I want to make sure that I get the names of everybody that came forward today. Would that be all right? If you guys could just follow Philip, that would be great. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Michael, would you make sure that there's some visitor cards there for Philip or one of our elders? Grab some of those cards. I want to make sure that that happens pretty quickly. I don't want to have them held up. All right. So, for the rest of us, it's time. It's time to speak up. That was the whole message title. Time to speak up. And so we bless you as you leave this place. Um, we love you. Home groups will meet this Thursday. We'll be back Sunday. But God bless you guys so much. We love you so much. Have a great day. Amen.